Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inshallah, I wanted to let you know this. We are in Ramadan. As we come up to the next Ramadan, we will be reaching our two-year mark, which is incredible to think about how um, really this project was essentially born out of the time of the pandemic. Uh, SubhanAllah, we have a, a, an organization, an advisory board that's in the Bay Area, if you're aware of it. It's called the Bay Area Muslim Mental Health Advisory Community Advisory Board. Community Advisory Board is CAB. So we call it the CAB. And this is from public health and mental health research that one of the best things you can do in a community is make sure that there are people who are advisors who are not part of any one organization. Some of them are part of the field. So in our case, part of the mental health, they are clinicians. But the other group of the, on the advisory board are really members of the community like all of you. We have a dentist, we have an attorney, we have teachers, we have Sunday school teachers, we have an imam, we have different people who have been part of our community advisory board on mental health issues. This group meets regularly, and what's really nice about them is that they advise on various things related to mental health. So seven, eight, nine years ago, it's been that long actually that we've had the cab running and meeting, they said we really need to bring a clinic to the Bay Area related to mental health, and alhamdulillah we were able to initiate that. And in the pandemic, when things got a little bit tough, we were able to, they were able, they actually came back, the cab, this advisory board came together and said, we really need something local to, to Bay Area. So not necessarily fully planning to do another clinic, but here, Madistan was born because this advisory board asked that we do this. They also, mashallah, advised on some really wonderful other initiatives that were educational, bringing Islam in with mental health. So in many ways, this organization, Madistan, is really homegrown. It's grown from the Bay Area. It's grown by your support and your du'as and the need that we have here. I also wanted to mention to you that part of our um, updates, by way of updates, is we have been teletherapy, virtual, for the last couple of years now. And, um, and many people were not really ready to do one-on-one -on -one in person therapy again. But now, mashallah, things are opening up. And so we're very happy to announce to you, alhamdulillah, that the office here at the MCC, East Bay, now has a branch for Madistan. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. In person. And I hope, inshallah, after you're done with this panel, that to please walk uh, with us. We'll take you on a little tour <laughs> and actually show you the office. Alhamdulillah, it's furnished. It's ready to go. And inshallah, our therapist will actually be seeing people directly in that office. Inshallah ta'ala. We will co continue to have the online services as well. And if you were here earlier in the day, you might have heard me share a little bit about my dream. And the dream is, alhamdulillah, we one step at a time, one step at a time. <laughs> our first step is to have, you know, our partners like an MCC to have a local in per, here, in-person medicine clinic office. But in the future, what we hope to add to that is to actually literally from the ground up design and build an actual medicine. People say, what is medicine? What is this word that you keep saying? So I'll say inshallah, and forgive me if you've heard this before, but what it is is Maristan is the shortened, Latinized word for a word in our tradition. So if you speak Farsi or Urdu, you know the word Bimar. Bimar is sickness, illness, and so on. Stan, location. So the Bimaristan are the centers for healing. Somebody who's ill. Bimaristan shortened is Maristan. And that's where we got our name, this inspiration. In Arabic, they were called Dar Shifa. Same idea, Dar, location of Shifa, healing. In Islamic history, some of my research and the work of my team at the lab, mashallah, we've been really working and actually we're writing a book at the moment on what is a Madistan and what is the history and how, what did Muslims contribute. And it's really phenomenal, mashallah, that not only did they create the Madistans, but they actually had inside of their hospitals along with physical illness you know your your organs anything related to bones anything related to surgery was there of course as any hospital but in addition the muslims were the first to add mental health the first psychiatric wards and this is incredible because it's at a time where the people before them other religious traditions or even the greeks and the romans and other civilizations that came before them didn't do this there's something about Islam that allows for a holistic healing, mind, body, soul connected to each other, and you don't take them apart. So they didn't discriminate between physical illness and mental illness. It's in the same healing center, the Bimaristan. 
And today you can still visit some of these. If you go over to Istanbul, there are still some standing that from the later years before the Ottoman Empire fell. You still see them at a stands there. You can see them still in Cairo. You can see them in certain countries in which they're actually still there. And you can see the remnants of what used to be the psychiatric wards. Did you know this? I had no idea <laughs> when I first began this work. I had no idea. We, I had no idea we even had a tradition like this. And so with that, sisters and brothers, that's what's going to start our discussion of our panel today. The discussion on mental illness and mental health and why don't we know our tradition and what happened really to us. And also bridging certain, each one of us has a certain amount of conversation we're going to have about therapy and about seeking out help. But I wanted to begin the conversation with what is that history? And why are we deciding to revive something that is historical, but I think they actually got it right. Today, modern medicine is very segmented, very much so. You feel kind of disjointed. <laughs> It's not very holistic in its healing. And our, our scholars understood that if you're going to heal the mind and you're going to heal the body, you're going to have to have the spirit part of it too, the religion, the deen, as part of it as well. And you're going to heal all of the senses together, the sound, the sight, the feeling, the emotions, all of it connected. So how do you create this? This is what we're setting out to do step by step. Our first step is reviving the Muslim's tradition of talk therapy, right? Which they actually created, subhanAllah, so and developed and really furthered. And then keep adding to it the other aspects of holistic healing. So that is a good segue to my topic that I, other than the introduction that I wanted to mention to you today. And I'll do my section and show and then pass the mic to the others on the panel. And hopefully towards the end, we'll take your questions as well. Speaking of holistic healing, one of the questions that always comes up is, isn't it enough to have good Iman? Isn't it enough to be a good Muslim and one who prays? Shouldn't this be sufficient? Do we really need to go to doctors? Do we really need to go get extra help? And I'll add to that also the question of, if a person, if I or someone in my family starts to not feel well, and they're actually not doing well mental health wise, should I just read Qur'an over them or have somebody read Qur'an over them? A ruqya. Shouldn't that be sufficient? Do we really need to have a medical model of, of healing, essentially? And it's interesting because if you had told me it was a broken leg or told me that person had diabetes, you would have no issue taking them to the doctor to set their leg or to give them insulin right, or so many other medications. Yet we get stuck right here. It comes to mental health and we get stuck. We get so stuck and we say, why are they so lazy? They're not getting off the bed or off the couch. Not realizing this could be something that's actually clinically diagnosed as depression. I'm telling you, even doctors have this stigma. They literally trained in the medical system and it comes all the way up until this point and they say, get better. Stop being so lazy. Get off your bed. Wallahi, I've seen this even from the educated. What is it about how sometimes we get so stuck in our ways that we don't see and understand this. So, inshallah, this is what I want to share with you. The word for reading Qur'an over somebody is called ruqya. Ruqya. Different cultures have different terms for this. This is the sunnah, word that we find that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had actually done ruqya over himself and others. And what did he do? He took parts of the Qur'an in which he would read or tell us to read in order to protect ourselves. Many of you have the sunnah habit of reading the three quls, for example, before you go to sleep, right? Or reading ayat al-kursi or maybe other parts of the Qur'an for protection. And this is perfectly fine. But you see, the Prophet ﷺ did not just stop at ruqya. You know why? And you know how we know? We have to read the tradition, the sirahs, more. You have, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the likes of his wife, Sister Aisha, radiallahu anha, who one time, one of her family members said, Sister Aisha, we know why it is that you have amazing knowledge related to the lineage. She was really good about the lineage of people. She could tell you the names of all the <laughs> people. And they said, we get it. You're the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And he was really good at this. This is one of the traits that he had. He had a great understanding of this. So she learned it from her father. 
And they said, we understand why you know to do the rules of Islam, fiqh. You studied directly with the Prophet Literally. They said, but you, she had a lot of knowledge on medicine. And they would say, how do you, where do you get the knowledge on medicine? We understand your connection to your father. We understand your connection to the Prophet What is it with medicine? And so she said, when the Prophet, listen very carefully to this. When the Prophet would get ill, the tribes of Arabia would come to him and offer him various medications or various herbs or various things that they would use. All the different people would say, try this, try this. In our group, in our tradition, in our tribe, in our people, this is what we do, this is what we do, this is what we do. And the Prophet would use them. This is very important. He would use them. He would pray, yes. He would make dua, yes. He would read ruqya, yes. But he would use the medication. See, people have lost sight of our own tradition, our own sira. Do you see what I'm saying? And so she said, I became so, the Sitna Aisha, I became so learned in medicine because I saw what the Prophet وسلم, was using and he would tell me to use it. Or he would tell me when someone would come to them and say we're sick, he would say to Sitna Aisha, to his wife, give them this, 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 and this. So she started to learn medicine and use medicine. We actually consider her from our tradition one of the earliest of the physicians. <laughs> You don't you normally hear Sana Aisha, the physician, right? But she was a, a healer, right? She used these things. And she would teach us and tell us. When the Prophet ﷺ would have a headache, yes, he would pray. Yes, he'd make dua. Yes, he would do the ruqya. But he'd also take something and tie it around his head to help his headache. He took action. And then we have the hadith. Where he says to us when a Bedouin came to him and said to him, Rasulullah, if we are sick, should we get treatment? And he said, Naam. Naam, ya ibadullah. Yes, O servant of God, tadawu. Seek out treatment. And then comes the rest of the hadith you heard me say earlier. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't give an illness to humanity unless he also gives its treatment or its cure. This is powerful. So when people say to us, is it enough to just do ruqya? Is it enough to just pray? Wouldn't that be sufficient? And I say, that's not the sunnah of the Prophet That is not the sunnah of the Prophet And with that starts our discussion on mental health. Because if the early Muslims built a mad stands, mind, body, soul, that had mental health, psychiatric health, integrated and in with, literally whole sections just for mental health, the first in human history to do this, along with their surgery wards, along with their psycho mental health, along with their internal medicine wards, along with their, and they were the first, they got it. They got it. Where are we? We've lost some of our tradition, haven't we? We lost our understanding of our own legacy, haven't we? SubhanAllah, and we're here to revive that. We're here, you all are here, to revive this, inshallah ta'ala. This is our plan, this is the dream. It may be a little bit of a pie in the sky, but nothing's too big for Allah, right? Nothing's too small, nothing's too big for Allah. My dream and my intention before Allah takes me off this earth, inshallah, is to bring back and revive this blueprint that the Muslims got right in the first place and bridge it to our modern science and research and bring the two together and the Muslims would be back at the forefront where they used to be. Say, say ameen, ameen, Allahumma ameen. Barakallahu feekum, inshallah, I'll pass the mic to the others, and each will say a little bit about this discussion, and then we will have your questions. Barakallahu feekum. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you so much for, um, you know, being here and uh, being a part of this really important conversation. Um, I'm going to briefly cover the um, topic of individual therapy. Um, and then, um, inshallah, um, Sister Nazad and Hamid will um, go through the rest. Um, so basically, individual therapy, how I like to see it is, it's um, our path to wellness. And, it, and it's an opportunity uh, for a one-on-one, -on -one, for one-on-one -on -one sessions with a the therapist 
uh, to really um, address our mental health and our mental well-being. Um, and you know, it can be really anything that we want it to be. Um, of course, there's a process of like intake assessment and you know identifying goals and a treatment plan. Um, but what happens in therapy and what goals we set and how much progress we make really depends a lot on us. And it is um, very much very unique to each individual. Um, and um, yeah, and so that's really important to keep in mind because sometimes, you know, we get asked questions, especially when we do consultations about, you know, whether I as a therapist will like give you answers or solve certain problems. And usually my answer is we're going to work together at that. And so the process really involves um, um, us gaining more insight about ourselves, what are some presenting challenges and what are some steps that we can take to cope and resolve those challenges. And of course, as Muslims, we all believe that, you know, we're going to face challenges. That's, that's not going to be, we're not able to avoid um, challenges in life. And our um, responsibility, as Dr. Rania um, ex explained, is to really take action and becoming, addressing the challenges, overcoming, learning ways to cope, and really um, become the best version of ourselves. Um, and I do believe that individual therapy really provides that opportunity. And oftentimes what I tell individuals who may be reluctant, of course, as we know, there's a lot of stigma uh, about mental health is, you know, mental therapy is not really about mental illness, meaning, you know, it's not necessarily about having a serious psychiatric, um, you know, diagnosis, but rather a path, a journey towards mental well-being, right? And what I usually advise individuals who may be reluctant is give it a try. And honestly, I have never had anyone who come, came back to me and said, I tried it and it's not for me, I hated it. Because it's really, oftentimes the feedback that I get is, wow, that felt really good. And it's not, these are not individuals who work with me, it's sometimes family members, community members who may need it. But, you know, oftentimes we find ourselves stuck in certain situations. And of course, it's very easy to say, like, this is what's meant to be, this is my destiny, this is what Allah wills, um, and not be afraid to take the steps. But when we take the steps, I think that road is really amazing. And oftentimes, again, the feedback that I've gotten is I'm glad I tried it because it helped me get to know myself better and also learn the skills and the tools to really just make the progress and help me be where I want to be in life. And, and sometimes in therapy what happens is when we work with individuals, it may be that we recognize that there may be challenges that stem from relationships, right, and, and family work. And so if it's um, challenges that we can work on individually, of course, that's what individual therapy is. And oftentimes when uh, it stems from, you know, other factors, like, for example, family, marriage, children, then we, re we may refer that client to either couples therapy or family therapy. Um, and, you know, with that, I'll hand over the mic to Brother Hamid, who's going to talk about couples therapy and what that involves. Zakla. Um, so I'm going to cover about like um, couple therapy and relationships as my expertise, but I just want to start with the quote that we not we're not capable of healing in isolation. We need other people. So what does it that what does that mean? That means like um, there's no way if you want to go through this um, journey of healing, as Sister Saul mentioned, um, alone. We need someone. As even like a therapy process, we are going through the relationship, therapeutic relationship with someone else to help us to see some aspect in us that we are not able to see that. So this is very important. The first part before entering to like this journey is to know about like, this is like a journey of get out of the isolation. I need support. I need other people to help me going through this. And this is the way uh, actually um, human creation that our nervous system, our brain, 
um, are not isolated, as interconnected and social. As a social human beings, we need that connection. Even that connection, sometimes it's it's helping us to go through this healing. And um, so that that shows the importance of relationship. That even like sometimes when we are alone, even like that isolation and loneliness, it gets it, it brings so much like struggles to us, and it makes us feel like. I'm, I'm alone in this, and this is kind of like a struggle for me. So when you see, if, if mentally struggles, see the environment and like the relationships. So don't see that like if we are going to see the problem in someone, we cannot evaluate without assessing the environment and without assessing the relationship that that person is um, into it. So... That's the importance of relationship. And even in a healing journey, we need to see and work on the relationships. And not only we see the problems in the relationship that struggles me personally, but also in general, when I'm in a good relationship, healthy relationship, that helps me um, to easier go through my personal journey, right? So it's important to like... Um, Actually, when when I going through something to like ask for help, not for other, but also from my family members, from my partner, from my spouse, to help me through this journey, and sometimes ask them, invite them to go through like family therapy or um, or sometimes like couple therapy, and and couple therapy is sometimes like not helping me to have like a healthy relationship not helping me to like go through those struggles that I have in my relationship, but also it can help me to go through my personal things that I struggle with because it's like a dark room that I'm not alone because I have my therapist. Also, I have my spouse with me through this. And if you like, as, as we all know, as the sister saw mentioned, individual therapy, all techniques, all interventions, very helpful, but uh, we need to consider that this person go to like to uh, his family, go to his like relationships. And, and if there's anything going on there, there's no way that I can feel okay. And I'm going to come back again with those struggles and like not going through the healing after that. So um, one thing that consider like when we need to consider even um, when we talk about couple therapy, but uh, Sister Nessa is going to cover about family therapy is that even if you see something going on with your kids, that's very good to seek for support for um, like um, child therapists, to work with them individually, but actually most importantly, when you see something going on in your kids, it's most importantly that comes from the family and the dynamic between the family members. And sometimes even from what they are observing as a kid in the family dynamic between their parents, right? So even like sometimes we encourage the, um, child to ask the parents to come and when we see the parents we see like okay it's good to seek like couple therapists first and work on a relationship because that helps a lot for your kids to go through his struggles or her struggles so it's important to consider that um, this is not a individual process this is like a family process and whether like as a couple as a family with the kids and also with others so another quote I just want to talk about is we are hurt in relationship and we heal in relationship. So if you see some struggles that you are going through, like mental mental struggles, you can see like most of it comes from the relationships, comes from the challenges in the relationship, whether at work, whether at school, whether at like um, in your relationships. So when you are seeing those issues, that's great to seek for support individually, but it's very important to, to see like, okay, this comes from the relationship, the hurt comes from the relationship, so the healing goes through the through the relationship too. So, like seeking that support, although I know it's really hard because maybe you know about uh, how important it is to work on this, but your spouse might not uh, encouraged or not uh, willing to do this. But this is like very important to ask and get that support, and actually um, seeking that support from your family member, from your spouse, from your um, parents that I want you to be with me through this process. I need you to, for this because this is not something, as we said, to go through it alone.
And third is one cannot leave a place until one has arrived on it. So this is not able to like when I'm feeling something, sometimes we tend to like feel like, okay, it goes away by time. So I need um, to address something that is going on. So this is very important that when I feel something, I need to address that. If I want to get rid of that feelings, that like negative feelings, that feelings that I struggle with, I need to feel it. And this is not something that I can go alone. I need support, whether from my family members or my therapist to help me to go through this, to help me to go, to go through these feelings because our body wants to protect us by um, actually, by by those coping mechanism, coping skills, to not feel our feelings, to not feel those feelings that are hard to feel. But therapy, one part of therapy that helps us to help us to, to go through those feelings, to feel them and to go through it. And, um, I, and, and it's very important to see like, okay, if I struggle with this, I need to address that. And even like by talking and to, to find that balance, if I see that struggle in my relationship, I need to address that problem. I need to address that things that are going on. Like time never helps us through like struggles and we need to address whether with our spouses, whether we are with our therapists, whether we, are, we consider to seek for that support from others. Um, I just want to cover some questions that we got um, on Instagram, which is related to this topic. And that is like, okay, if we... Um, actually know about the stigma, if we, sell, if we see like a stigma on mental health in our family members and they're not willing for this service, they're not willing to go through this, how we should address this stigma, how we should help them, how we should encourage them to seek therapy or even to come with us uh, through this process. And I want to say this, that the first things is do not teach other people, your family members, about how important mental health is. Just try to experience that, and by being yourself, by your presence, by your uh, being, you can help them to feel like, okay, this works. My kid, my spouse, she went to therapy, and she got benefits of, I get encouraged to do the same. I'm encouraged to, like, seeking that support. So do not teach that. And second, stigma comes from the feeling. Some people, if they are not willing to seek for the support, Part of it comes from like, I'm scared to going through this process because I don't know what to expect. I don't know like how it's going. I don't know like um, if I'm going to have a, like a good relationship with my therapist. I don't know if he understands me. I don't know what happens. So these are the things that definitely is um, validated. It is really scary to go through this process for the first time. So if you see that stigma, in your family members, try to validate the feelings underneath it. Try to validate that, see, I hear you. I hear that it is hard for you to talk about your things. Even like for, for Muslims, they, they, it's really hard to go through like non-Muslim therapists. But even if they want to go to the Muslim therapist, they feel like that therapist is in our community. I'm scared to talk about my like um, relationship challenges with someone in our community. So these are the things that are validated. It's not only a stigma, these are, these are the feelings underneath that stigma that, that needs to be validated, especially from the family members. So I encourage you to, like if you see these like stigmas, to go through what's, what's the feeling underneath it and try to address that and try to validate them. And validation and like your presence and like um, reassurance can help your family members to encourage to seek this support. I'll pass to Sister Nissa for family. Assalamu um, alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's a joy to be here with you today and, and to see Maristan open their office over here. Alhamdulillah. Um, I want to just take a moment to tell you a little bit about myself. I work with children. A lot of my practice is with kids, and parents often bring their kids to us. And what I find is the most um, where I see the most benefit and where we truly make change is when we work with the entire family. We know that families are the foundation of society. It's where we acquire our inner voice, where we learn about relationships, um, where we learn um, 
how to communicate with each other, problem solve, where we build resilience, we learn coping skills by mirroring what we see um, our parents do, right? And so when parents bring children to me, I often talk about, let's work as a family together. Let's look at the system as well and see what we need to do to make change. And there are definitely, and our, our kids are facing a lot of challenges out there, right? We're raising our kids as in a society. Some of their values does not reflect our own values. There's just different times. There's technology. There's all these things that make parenting very challenging these days. Some of those things are within our control, and some of them are not. What is within our control is creating families in which children feel comfortable and safe in which they develop a healthy self-image. And that is within our controls. Um, and what I remind parents is that in order for us to be able to model that for our kids, we gotta take care of ourselves. So that um, leads me down this road of working with parents and finding out a little bit about themselves. And I encourage all of us, and I wanna remind all of us that a lot of us come from countries in which we're colonized, or there's wars going on. There are all these, um, we all come from different backgrounds and a lot of us carry trauma. And what we don't acknowledge is ourselves. Sometimes as parents, we're like, just fix my child. I'm fine, just fix my child. But it's very hard to do that because you are primarily who, who is, you're teaching your child by the way you act, by the way you communicate. And so working within, within ourselves, as Saha was saying, working individually, or even um, Hamid was talking about working as a couple in your relationship there, because that is what our kids are picking up. So I really wanna just kind of emphasize that, to acknowledge ourselves, where we were raised. There's a lot of trauma in a lot of our community and that shows up as anger, conflict, and inability to maybe express ourselves. And it's really, really important that we deal with that first. What I thought I'd just share with you is a couple of tips. The, there's a lot of extensive research out there that shows that home environments in which there's a lot of conflict and less warmth, it leads to greater anxiety and depression. And Yachin Institute, where Brother, uh, Dr. Omar Suleiman was just speaking, it's his organization and they do a lot of wonderful research. They've done a preliminary study in the Muslim American households and they looked at three dimensions in the home environment. And I thought we could maybe just talk about those three dimensions briefly and maybe take home some tips and make sure and, and learn from it. So the three dimensions they looked at is cohesion and that's the degree of commitment and support family members provide to one another. They looked at expressiveness, the extent to which family members are encouraged to express their feelings directly and openly. And they looked at conflict, the amount of openly expressed anger and um, conflict amongst um, family members. And they found, and so I just wanna share their finding and maybe take away two points on how can we increase some of these things in our family and how can we decrease some of these things in our family. So with cohesion, they found that the greater cohesion in a family predicts lower rates of anxiety and depression. So, you know, and that kind of makes sense, right? If there's more cohesion, if everyone feels like they're supported, then that is gonna make us feel a little less anxious and more connected to people. So how, is, how can we do that in our family? What are some takeaways? They came up with um, coming up with family traditions. Those are really important. Right? Whether they be um, going hiking on the weekends or family nights or game nights or having traditions around Eid, those are things that kids look forward to and expect. So it's really important that we try and look at some of that in our lives. Spending quality time together. In the age of cell phones and social media, sometimes we're all in the same room, but we're not truly connected. Having those moments, even if it's once a week where we put our phones down, have family dinner together, or play games with each other where you're actually interacting. Um, also, simple things like um, cooking together or when it comes to dinner time, cleaning up together, setting the table together. I come from, I, my parents are from India and I feel like we do a lot of coddling in our culture, like everything's done for you. 
But having those responsibilities really early on, A, it builds independence, it gives kids a sense of self-esteem that I contribute to this family. And that's an important thing for them to realize, that I'm part of this family and I make contributions to it, even if it's just setting the table. So doing those little things together helps increase cohesion. The second thing they looked at is expression. Um, you know, are, do family members feel comfortable? Are they invited to express themselves? So ways that we can make this happen more in our family, asking open-ended questions like, what do you think happened? Even if you're reading a storybook to someone, stopping in between saying, what do you think is gonna happen next? Why do you think this character did this, right? Um, and when we speak to them, to do what I call whole body listening turning our faces toward them, making eye contact, getting down at their level. Those are little things that make people feel heard, right? Avoid, the second thing um, when it comes to communication is avoid reacting. A lot of times a kid might be like, ah, oh, my life is horrible, and we go, we jump to, no, it's not, mashallah, you have a head over, you know, you have a roof over your shoulder, you have food to eat, what do you mean your life is horrible? And so I'm not saying to agree with them, but I'm saying to hear them out and acknowledge that you've actually heard what they said, right? So when your child comes to you and said, everything, nothing works, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Tell me what's going on, right? It doesn't mean you agree with them. It just means that I'm willing to listen to what you have said. And once you listen to them, you can be like, yes, that, that is tough. So how are we going to deal with it? How can I help you? Um, a, ver a lot of times when we listen to our kids, we react to them. We don't respond to them. Reaction is like, you know, they, they trigger us and we're upset and we respond. We react instead of actually responding in an intelligent way or an intentional way, not intelligent, but in an intentional way. Um, and also initiate conversations on things that you might con consider taboo subjects. Because if they don't get it from you, they're going to get it from YouTube or Google. So it's really important to open those uh, means of communicating. Have family nights, have family meetings in which you discuss even little things like, let's take a family trip together. What is your opinion? Um, the last thing, uh, the area that they looked at was conflict. And they found that the greater the conflict in family predict, predicts higher rate of depression and anxiety. And so I don't mean to say that our, our, that disagreements don't happen in the family. Of course, we all will have different ways of looking at things, but how do we handle it? Is it a lot of yelling and screaming? Or do we create avenues in which we explain to kids that we all have our feelings, we all have our emotions, validate them, name your own. It's okay to say, I'm really angry right now, I need to take a break, right? because our kids will do things that anger us. Conflict happens in families, but how do we handle it? And what we need to do first is look at ourselves, figure out what's happening internally for us, and then help our kids regulate ourselves first, and then help our kids regulate and problem solve. Um, and also just modeling how do you recover when, from when you have a disagreement, because disagreements happen. When I'm angry, I am not my best self. I have three kids. There are moments where I probably reacted in a way that I shouldn't have. Can we come back from, to that, right? Can I go, am I able to go back to them and said, say, listen, you know, the reaction I just had, that was probably over the top. I am sorry. And we've got to be able to say that and look internally and look at what keeps us from doing that, right? What are our beliefs about conflict um, and work on ourselves? So with that, I'm just going to say that a lot of times people bring their kids, and please do take your kids. But also be willing to look at yourselves, ourselves as adults, and um, what's going on for us. OK, bismillah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to try to keep it nice and short, and then inshallah we'll pass on to our last panelist, and then we want to make sure that we get time to answer all of your questions. 
Um, so I've just been kind of taking notes in the background as everybody's been talking because, you know, and I think one of the first thing that came to mind was a few weeks back, uh, Brother Hamid, me and Sister Tiffany were at Berkeley and we were having a, a beautiful discussion with about 50 Berkeley students. And it was a beautifully mixed crowd. So we didn't have a predominantly female, um, you know, turnout. It was it was great. And I'll remember this one question a brother asked and I think Hamid kind of addressed it and we all just supported. And he said, you know, I want to be, we were, we were in this discussion about being humble and embodying, you know, the prophet's body language and the way that he approached conflict and the way he spoke to his, you know, people and family and the environment around him and his companions. And he said, I really want to be like that, but I don't know how to tell my parents that I don't want to be this like male figure that everybody thinks I should be. How do I, how do I come with this humbleness and how do I approach things with this sincerity that the prophet had? And how do I take that back to my elders and say, this is how I want to be. And it's from the Dean. And we kind of like all just paused and we looked at him and we we're like, it's, it was such a pure question. And you know, we, it, we, we said what we're always told in the Dean, right? When you want to tell somebody Islam is a religion of purity, you embody purity. And when you tell people Islam is an honest religion, you act with honesty in all that you do in all the situations that you're a part of. And he kind of just took a step back and he's like, you know, okay. And it's, it's not, it's easy for, you know, us to kind of sometimes sit and say things. And then when the reality comes, you know, when, when you're in that situation and you're really trying to respond, um, it could look very differently. But I, I am not a parent, and so I usually come at things, and my discussion is usually based around the child of parents. And I, I always encourage parents, you know, you should really think about what your child is not telling you, because they're having discussions in these social circles. They're having them at their MSAs and in their classrooms and in discussion posts, and it, things are going to come up. And just like, you know, Sister Nus had kind of talked about the introduction of social media, we're all self-diagnosing ourselves on social media. Their TikTok doctors are a thing and it's happening. And I promise you they're doing it to their parents too. I've heard so many kids say, I wish my parents would just go to therapy because I know they need it. I wish we could do family therapy, but my family's not open to it. I my mom is like this, we don't need this. My dad is like never home and I can't get him to, to even sit in a room and have a conversation with me. And so we force different connections. And my brain, I, I work at Dr. Anya's lab and it's, it's an honor to do research there, but my primary area of research is in addiction research. And when we're not building healthy connections, we're building unhealthy ones because we are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as social beings. We are very social. We love community. Mashallah, emb Islam embodies that. So if I'm not getting a healthy connection with my ummah, I will create unhealthy ones. And it's not, it's not a fault in, in the individual and it's not laziness. It's because we internally will yearn for this connection. And I always say, you know, substances are non-discriminatory. They don't care what you look like and they don't care where your education level is at. They, you will always have access and it will always work. And the day that it doesn't, you just take a little bit more. And then we're down, you know, a really difficult path. And then parents say, I'm taking my kid to therapy. And I'm like, wow, you know, mashallah, like, could, I, could I just thought about it a little bit earlier sometimes. And your kid, I promise you, at some point, your kid has hinted to you that they want this. They wish you would do it. And they've had this conversation with you. They may have not come out and said it up front. And that goes to Sister Nusat's point of the importance of establishing a safe environment at home for your kids to be open and your kids to feel safe and say, I'm really struggling with this. And you're there and you're looking them in the eye and you're not like, yeah, hold on, on the phone. Because that, I'm sure we've all, if you're on social media, there's this like really predominant image that continues to circulate about a son who approaches his dad when he's very, very young. And he's like, dad, come play with me. And the dad's like, not now. And he's kind of on his laptop in the background. And then he goes back. And then he's like, every, every panel photo is the kid getting a little bit older. And eventually the kid is a teenager and he's, you know, in a very dark environment as the graphic depicts. And the dad says, son, let's talk. And the son says, not now. Because for years, he's been trying to get his father's attention. And for years, he's been trying to connect with him. And then when the dad wants to now turn around and connect, that opportunity, you know, inshallah, it's never lost. And with, with dua, prayer, and professional support, it is never a lost opportunity. And subhanAllah, I've had people call the clinic, and they're like, I'm 55, and I'm ready. And I'm like, great, let's go. Because the age doesn't matter. It's when you're, when you're ready, we're there. And it's, it's all aspects. And importantly, Allah's there. 
you know, and I want to I want to say that that's the most important aspect in all of this is having that pure intention that this is a part of my deen. I'm not doing something that violates my you know, the way that I am as a Muslim, I'm not doing something that violates my right to my family or my wife or my husband or any of that. This, you're, you're doing them, mashallah, a great favor. I swear. <laughs> and I wish I could say that and emphasize that enough. Because as a child, and you know, I, I worked with a lot of youth here at MCC. I did a talk just in the conference room a few years back on addiction. And I had a brother tell me, he came up to me and he said something. He's like, I haven't said that to somebody in 15 years. In 15 years, he had never shared that. And he shared it right here in the masjid. And this, so it's happening, it's real. And, you know, Brother Hamid touched on this, and I, I really want to just emphasize the importance of us seeing ourselves. I don't know if, if anybody's like this, but sometimes you think, okay, this is, this is like my role as a husband, and this is my role as a father. And those are distinct roles, but you don't necessarily change in all of that, right? You're bringing you to every single one of these scenarios. So Sometimes you look at, you know, something that might come up in individual therapy, but it really makes you a better partner and it really makes you a better father and it really makes you a better employee and a better manager and across the board as you continue to get better and you, you know, you kind of support yourself, everybody, your circle is going to start to change because that support permeates through all your relationships. And so it's really important to also consider like when your kids are, you know, mashallah, I, I would imagine parenting is a very difficult thing. So it's okay to come to therapy and say, I'm just, I'm exhausted. Like, I'm burned out. I've got three kids. I've got a full-time job. You know, inflation, whatever it is, you know, you're coming, you're coming there. And that's what your therapist really is there for. And I'll tell you, like, I'm very open. Like, I go to therapy and I'm totally, I love it. And every time something happens at home, my husband's like, just talk to your therapist about it. Because for him, it's a one-stop shop. Whatever comes up, I'm like, you know, my therapist is not like, you know, an MD or like an across-the-board everything doctor. And he's like, no, 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 it doesn't matter because it's, that's my space. And so I can go there and I can talk about whatever and do whatever. And I promise you one of the most beautiful things is I've never asked a question in therapy that I didn't get an answer for. Because if one person doesn't know, the community is so tight-knit. It's Sister Nuzhat is one of our super supervisors. We've got Dr. Anya, mashallah, who's well-connected herself and just everybody else. So if we have questions at the clinic or if one of our clinicians has a question that comes up and we're like, we don't 100% know how to answer this, we're like, we will find somebody who, who knows the answer to that. And it will be professional and it will be, it will be following all the right legalities and confidentiality and protecting our, our clients and protecting our community, but also making sure we're getting you the best possible information that you need. Not just something that, oh, we think it's this. No. We're, I promise you, there's so you have a one-on-one -on -one with your therapist, but your therapist is in the background working hours. After years of education, they are working hours to make sure that the care that you get is real and it's it's grounded in Islam and it's grounded in the professional, you know, in the field and the legalities of what we, you know, everything that we do. And I'll end with this, and I, I said this at Berkeley too, because I, I felt, you know, I'm sitting with a lot of students. A lot of them were new to Berkeley. It was their first year. And they were really struggling with the notion of, you know, are we really all connected as we, as, as we seem to be? And I was like, absolutely. And when the new year came, you know, there's this, there was a beautiful quote. It circulated all over Instagram. And um, what it said was, it's not fair that we laughed together, but you cried alone. And so kind of coming back and recognizing that the people who you share laughter with and joy and you go to the masjid with, check in on those people check in on them and ask them, like, how are you doing? And not just like, how are you doing in passing while you're putting your shoes on? It's like, stop, you know, look at them, ask them, how are you doing? And if you notice changes in their behavior, hey, I've noticed like we haven't gone to the masjid together in a few days, or, you know, I know I've noticed you've been coming to classes a little, a little late. Are you okay? Is there something that I can do? You know, and, and build that, build that relationship. One of the hardest things to tell somebody is you're the only one who can help yourself. Mashallah, this is not true. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to start, we, and then we have such a robust, educated, well-resourced community. So look around you, look at the people in the room. When I was at Berkeley, I said there's about 50, 50 of you. That means 49 people can offer any one person help at any given moment. And that stands true for this community. It stands true within your households. And so recognize that, you know, your household is a unit. It's your, it's your little mashallah baby community, right? So, so whatever you take outside when you leave your house, whatever you take outside, bring it back with you and, and sit down and have those conversations with your kids. You're all here today, mashallah. When you go home, maybe not today, it's a little exhausting, in a few days, sit with your kids. Talk to them. If you're a child, sit with your parents. Mom, I, I just want to go out for coffee with you. I feel like I miss you. I haven't seen you in a while. 
Maybe you saw her yesterday. It doesn't matter. Just make that space. And in turn, it's this like beautiful reciprocal relationship. I make time for you and you make time for me. There's a responsibility on both sides as a child to a parent and as a parent to a child. Right? So inshallah, that's of benefit. I'm going to pass it on to Jenna, who's going to talk a little more um, about her clinic and, and inshallah, get support right to your fingertips. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So the scope of the work that I do at Maristan is very much taking all of this amazing theory and putting it into practice. Um, it's great to theorize and to know the background of certain things, but at the end of the day, we have to actually implement and do the work in order to truly benefit. Um, so I'm going to speak to a few kind of apprehensions or things that I come across. Um, I'm kind of the first stop along the way to your therapist. I'll answer the phone. I'll answer the emails. Um, kind of get everyone that comes in and get them to their first appointment. Um, one thing that we see a lot, and this is something that a few people have mentioned, is this concern about confidentiality. Um, we are a community clinic. We're a community organization. A lot of us know each other from our masjid communities, maybe a therapist up here might be your family auntie or uncle or something like that. And there's a lot of times this shame about sharing things with our community because we don't want to get outed or, oh my gosh, am I going to see my therapist at Jumara and they're going to go put my business on blast or whatever it is, which first of all, I just want to validate that that is a very real concern. Um, when I was sharing a little bit about her personal therapy experience, I myself saw my first therapist at the college that I went to, and I freaked out when I saw her in there on the community. I was like, oh my God, my mom was here. She didn't tell my mom that I was snitching on her, and it just, it, it stressed me out, and I didn't want to go again, and it was a whole thing, and that's a very valid concern because a lot of us, we, only Allah knows what's truly in everybody's lives and what's truly in everybody's hearts. Um, but that should never be a preventer to getting the help that you need. And as Mona was saying, obviously there's certain legalities of therapy um, in terms of we are all bound by the law of California. Even myself, who's not a practicing clinician, I still had to sign paperwork once I was hired in terms of protecting everybody's information, protecting everybody's confidentiality. Um, so don't let that be something that will prevent you from getting the help that you need. Everybody that's sitting up here before you behaves in the utmost professional um, and edeb type of manner where anything that you share in a session, even if you were to just come up to one of us afterwards and we're not in an official session, you haven't signed paperwork, we still take that as an amana. Obviously, again, it's a legal law, but before that, it's an amana because we are each other's keepers. We are each, our brother's keepers, our sister's keepers, where anything that is shared is truly a sacred trust between you and your therapist between you and God that will never ever be broken. Um, another thing that I come across is there's a lot of individuals that have a fear that they don't have control in this situation. Um, and control is something that a lot of us can struggle with, right? We're still kind of coming in a post-pandemic world where a lot of our worlds were thrown upside down and we didn't have this aspect of control. So we feel afraid that a therapist is going to make us do something that we don't want to do. They're going to tell us something and now we have to do it. Um, this is something I learned from Brother Hamid that he kind of brings up a lot in some of his work with couples therapy is people yeah, they just don't want to be told what to do where they're like, oh, my therapist is going to force me to do something or they're going to tell my spouse this or they're going to tell my family that. But at the end of the day, it's it's purely you're going to get out of it what you put into it. If you want to get better, you will get better. But if you're apprehensive and you're not willing to share and you're not willing to learn or be open, then you're not going to get the greatest return on your investment, really. Um, so whenever I'm speaking to clients, especially if they're a first timer, they've never been to therapy before, I always just let them know how much is really in their control. If you don't like the first therapist that you had a consultation with, great, let me set you up with someone else. Everyone is a different, we all have different personalities, aptitudes, strengths, weaknesses. Um, don't let the first experience be the only one if it didn't work for you. Where we have so many different people that work with us, so you have to give it sometimes more than one chance. Um, the first session didn't go great. All right, let's try it again. And you have to communicate your needs, right? Something my great grandma La Yadiha always says is, "Closed mouths don't get fed." So if whatever help it is that you need, you have to ask for it. And you can even tell your therapist. Sometimes I tell my therapist like. I'm not really rocking with this right now. Let's talk about this instead. Or, you know, it kind of makes me uncomfortable when we use this approach. How about we do this? And a good therapist, in which 
everyone sitting up here is a great one, mashallah. They're going to be very receptive and they're going to be able to meet you where you're at and serve your needs so that way it doesn't feel like you're a little kid who's in timeout. Because that's not what therapy is at all. You're there to learn and you're there to benefit and it really is entirely on your terms in terms of what you want to cover, what you want to talk about, and what you want to get out of it. Um, and the last thing is really just being open um, and having not being afraid to just try something new. That's another thing that I come across as well, is there's a lot of people that are just very apprehensive to trying something new. And something that my therapist always tells me and that most therapists will tell you is that sometimes you're gonna feel worse on your way to feeling better, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that it's not working. That doesn't mean that you're doing therapy wrong. There's no way to do therapy wrong. Um, but sometimes it is uncomfortable. Sometimes you're going to sit in your session and you might cry or you might bring up uncomfortable thoughts or memories or feelings. But that doesn't mean that you aren't getting where you need to go, right? As Brother Hammond said, in order to depart from a situation, you have to arrive at it. So a lot of that discomfort is you arriving at whatever it is that needs to be worked out or that needs to be purged from your system. And sometimes it is uncomfortable, but that's actually a good sign, right? That means that you are finally getting to the root of whatever the issue might be, whatever the concern might be, in order for you to work your way towards health and towards healing. Um, and at the end of the day, we're all here to serve and to better ourselves and each other. So it's having trust with each other, having that community, having that patience in order to receive the help that we need to be better individuals, better community members, better family members, and in turn, a better and stronger ummah, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, mashallah. How was that, folks? Useful? Yes, I hope, inshallah. May Allah bless you all, mashallah. We wanted to make sure that there was time really for discussion back and forth with the folks that are here and also the folks online, mashallah. We know that there's a number of you also online, so we just wanted to make sure that we that you know that we know that you're with us, inshallah. We'll monitor your questions as well, but also take questions from the audience here. So with that, inshallah, what we'll do is really just open this up for discussion and for the questions you have. And, who, and if you want to tell us who you'd like to answer the question, that'd be great. Or if it's just open, we'll figure out who the right person is, inshallah. It works. All right, who's the first brave soul? Alhamdulillah. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, two questions, like two of you mentioned that when I talk to my therapist, so you are therapist, so why you guys need a uh, therapist? So uh, one, and second, how does this therapy session work in terms of uh, insurance, what insurances are covered? All right, I'll take the first one and Jenna can take the second one, if that's okay. So. Um, to summarize the question for everybody, it sounds like, why do I go to therapy? Is that the question? So I'll clarify. I'm a doctoral student, not yet a therapist, um, but I start clinical work in June. So inshallah, in June, I will, I will be a, a psychologist in training. Um, this work is, mashallah, very difficult. Very difficult. I cannot express to you the calls that I get. You know, my, somehow my phone number, my personal phone number, because of our insurance panels, is somewhere in the community. And so I'll get calls all the time. And I've got calls from people crying. I've got calls from people in their closet. I've got calls from moms, dads, and, and even like just younger folks who are like trying to get to therapy. And how do I talk to my parents? And how do I get me to where you are? You know? And so one of the, one of the, the biggest um, kind of responsibility that I take on myself in this position and in this field is that how do I make sure I'm in the best space for my for my community? And that is just as holistic as we approach our work, right? So how do I make sure my dean is in the right space? How do I make sure my physical health is in the right space, but also my like my mental health? And and I, I am I am of the mindset that it's very difficult to get your to kind of get your mental health in a right space on your own. You need a community and part of your community is a therapist, you know, and part of that is me being able to go there, go to my therapist and talk. I'm also, I have a family. I'm married and marriage is not, mashallah, not always easy. So as, I, as I'm as i a full-time student and as I'm, I'm a wife, but also I'm an employee and how, how do I manage my life 
um, without the support of a therapist and, and my team. And my therapist is definitely a part of my team. And I think it's one of the things I always tell people is in as part of our community, I think it's really hard sometimes to have a space that's yours, right? So if you're like one of four children, I'm one of five. So I got nothing, mashallah, to myself, nothing. So I'm like, when I started therapy, you know, at one point my husband's like, can I ask your therapist a question? I said, no, because he is my therapist. You want your own therapist? Mashallah, you go get your own therapist, but he is my therapist. So it's my space. It's my space to go in there and, and discuss my troubles because I'm only human and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests all of us in different ways. So even as, you know, I'll talk to, about myself, even as I sit up here, sometimes it's easy to say, well, you're a PhD student or you're this, you know, and I, and I promise you what we say is like most of our community struggling with something. And so a way to, to kind of support and facilitate our, my journey through, through my own life, but also my journey through my community is, is for definitely me to lean on, on, on therapy and be able to know that I have that support in, in kind of my back pocket if I need it. As I pass the mic, I'm just going to add one quick thing, if it's important, just um, helpful. It's actually part of our professional ethics in the field that if you are giving care, then you yourself must receive care. So it's actually one of the standards of the field as well. So we are taught in our programs that if you are going to be a support for someone else, you yourself and some of our programs mandate that we actually sit in therapy ourselves to become therapists. So it's actually part of the profession as well. And it makes a lot of sense. And honestly, if I drop back to Islam, it is exactly what we learn. Just like with teachers, you are not allowed to teach unless you are connected to your teachers. If you are cut off from that, then you can go rogue. <laughs> Right? And that is the same thing in clinical work as well. Um, to add one more thing to this, um, this is like um, maybe it's very important to know it's, therapy is not about the knowledge, it's about the experience. And even me as a therapist, I know the knowledge, but when it comes to my life, I'm not a good person to see what's going on in me. I need someone else as a facilitator to help me to go through this process even by knowing the knowledge. Also, I'll just say everybody needs therapy. <laughs> and it's a lot of people will almost go to therapy as a last resort or after stuff has already hit the fan, but prevention is really important as well, right? That's why there's not just divorce counseling, there's premarital counseling. There's counseling before you have children or, you know, therapy is a great way, like he was saying, to just know yourself better, um, to just have a good understanding of yourself and your circumstance before, um, you know, God forbid, issues do arise. Um, to answer your question about insurance, alhamdulillah, we are credentialed with a few insurance companies and have a few more on the way. So we currently have contracts with Cigna, Aetna, United Behavioral Health, Magellan, um, and we have our Anthem contract on the way. Um, finances is never a factor for anyone ever getting turned away from our services. So alhamdulillah, through community support, um, and just zakat funding and things like that, we are also able to offer financial aid and sliding scale. Um, mental health should be as free and, ex well, not free because we all need to get paid, um, but as accessible as it can be, inshallah. We're just talking about social media. I saw a post that said getting traumatized is free and accessible, so therapy should be free and accessible. Um, so we really do our best just to provide that access for everyone. And if you ever do have a certain insurance company that you're wondering about, um, we do offer super bills and other things like that. So we just always welcome you to reach out, send us an email and see how we can work with you, inshallah. Um, uh, so yeah, I just wanted to say here, um, that uh, I myself, a uh, mental health uh, clinician myself many years, but I wanted to share that, uh, I would say like we, but I'm not exactly part of uh, the group, but uh, we opened the first um, uh, Islamic uh, rehab in America, here in uh, uh, Castro Valley, uh, Tranquility Rehab. Uh, so very first ever in this country, uh, roughly two weeks ago, but as of this coming week, we're initially uh, taking in the clients. Um, so your guys is um, seems like everything that I got uh, from everybody on the panel is this is more catered towards the uh, outpatient uh, services. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is uh, the rehab. Of course, is going to be the inpatient. Most of my I have outpatient experience, but most of my experience in the inpatient rehab. So maybe I can uh, check uh, 
Lanier and stuff to see if we can coll collaborate because we will take the patients in, uh, treat them, and then at some point we need to transition them to outpatient. And Madison seems to be the ideal thing for uh, the Muslims just to stay within a Muslim environment and treatment. And then, of course, as other brother mentioned, um, uh, asked about how is it that the person himself can. And it's a good saying. Of course, you guys are associated with Stanford. It's the one of the top psychiatrists, the uh, Irvini Alom, Doctor Irvini Alom. Uh, his long retired thing is 90s, but he said the, the, the quote that uh, only the wounded healer truly heals. So in that case, you know, those of us that you know are in this field in one way or another, we've had some sort of background that uh, you know needed to be addressed in the mental health, and so we have probably overcame. We've gained knowledge. We went to school, educated. Now we're in a much better position uh, to quote you know. Uh, help those uh, of us uh, that need, especially with the stigma and everything in the Islamic community. So I just wanted to share that. You know. Yes, thank you so much. And Mubarak to Tranquility House, mashallah. Um, we're very much connected to Dr. Amr Rahimullah, who was my colleague at, <laughs> at Stanford, mashallah, and also somebody who's been advising us and part of actually our lab as one of our, um, he's actually one of our um, supervisors in our lab consultants of our lab, thank you, I was looking for the exact title, the consultants in our lab, mashallah, related to addictions. So the connection is already made, alhamdulillah. And yes, absolutely, this is outpatient treatment until inshallah one day we're able to actually build that madistan, that dream, um, in which we could at that point in the future consider anything inpatient. You are doing something that's incredible related to addictions specifically. And yes, absolutely, there will be a cross collaboration, I'm sure. And it's already started through Dr. Ahmed. Barakallahu fikum, inshallah. Sister Lubna, can I go to you? Assalamu alaikum, Jazakallah, so much for you wonderful people to be out there for us and helping us out. We didn't even know that this existed and we had these kind of issues, you know. And uh, we are so grateful and so lucky to be in this community for people like you. Uh, I just had one little question. Uh, what age is the minimum age for uh, children to start therapy? Because they are already developing, and uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, just wanted to know that answer. Assalamu alaikum. Um, that's a really good question, and it really depends. So I work in the school uh, schools during the day, um, and the youngest at the school district is five. It looks different from what you might. It might be a lot of skill building. Actually, you know. When you think about what we do with kids at therapy, it's we can't control what's going on in their lives, but we can build resiliency by helping them identify what they're going through, what they're feeling, and how to cope with it. We teach coping skills. And quite honestly, I've seen people work with four-year-olds as well. It looks different, but that is something that can be done as young as four and five. And there's play therapy, which you're right, they even start even younger. Um, there is PCIT, which is play therapy, which will they even they teach moms and kids to interact. And they, they'll have like an earbud in the mom's that, um, ear, and they'll teach them how to interact. And play therapy is done quite young, where uh, it's in undirected play. But through that, they do help children process things. We're not set up for such a young age, but it is. Just on the topic of um, therapy for children, play therapy is one, and art therapy is another one as well. That's my line of study that I'm currently working towards right now, inshallah. Um, and like Sister Nuthet said, with children, oftentimes it's difficult to just sit there and talk at them for a certain period of time. Um, and even as adults, we can struggle to just talk about our feelings sometimes, and verbalizing things can be difficult. So something like play therapy or art therapy, which, by the way, can be done with anybody of any of all ages, um, engaging in some sort of art form or some sort of kind of bodily process can oftentimes really help. First of all, put a buffer sometimes if 
directly verbalizing something is triggering or difficult, um, but especially with children, if they're not even cognitively there yet, giving them something more physical, you know, using bright colors or textures that are going to activate their senses in a way um, it helps give them an expressive outlet while also, like she was saying, building coping mechanisms, resiliency, um, and giving them something tangible to focus on to help channel their emotions and what they're feeling. Thank um, okay. um, First of all, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I actually stayed back to kind of celebrate the initiative and, and you know, for the support. But um, as I hear you guys, um, a question popped into my mind. And forgive me, my knowledge is very limited in this space. Um, I'm kind of curious, is there a difference between the tests that come from Allah, from an Islamic perspective, and trauma, right? I, I was under um, the impression that therapy is needed when there's trauma, but is is there a difference between a test and trauma? And would you, um, um, what would you say? Would would someone need therapy if they're going through a test? Thank you so much for the question. I really appreciate it. And I, you know, I always say this to folks: if a question comes up, it's probably on many people's minds. And I appreciate that also because it adds even more nuance to the discussion we've had on the panel so far. I want to remind us, inshallah, to answer your question. You're right. When people think about trauma, they think, okay, one of the solutions might be therapy. What about my everyday struggles? My everyday, you know, we might call them kind of these small, you know, wear and tear of the everyday life, right? It's a wear and tear in the very fabric of your life, right? Do I really need to get therapy for these things? Or if Allah tests me, which he says, he's already told us. It's in the Quran. It's part of our belief system as Muslims to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us, right? He's going to say, he's, he told us, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ Right? We're going to literally test you, trial you, right? With something of fear and difficulty and hunger and loss of wealth and, and so on and so forth and people and so on in our life. This concept, do we really need to get help for this in therapy if this is something Allah already told us is going to happen? And the answer is, it depends. Here's why I say that. It's really something where it depends on you, your background, your family's support or the lack of it, right? Your social supports or the lack of it. Who is part of your circle? Sometimes people, when they're having the everyday, kind of that wear and tear of the everyday fabric, they might have a kind of family that is supportive to them, whereas someone else doesn't have that. They might have, maybe it's not family, maybe it's the friends. They have some really excellent group of people that help them through this, right? And they're willing to shoulder the support. Other people don't necessarily have this. Some other people might have the finances, the resources to be able to help themselves. Other people don't, subhanAllah. So it really depends on you. What I say is, and this comes to me, what I, what I understand this is directly from our own deen and sharia. To me, I look at the Qur'an. First, this is the place I go to the first, and I hope it's the first place you go to. And here, this is where I see in the ayah, the verse, we might read it and know it. When I quote it to you, you'll say, oh, I know that verse. But we may not necessarily connect it <laughs> and apply it. And what the verse is, is basically where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if we don't know, then we need to actually ask for support and help. We need to ask those who know. What is the verse? What's the verse? Do we know? Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. And the reason I bring that up in this context is exactly that. If you have the supports, if you have the help, if you have, you know, you're able to kind of even yourself kind of pull it up yourself, alhamdulillah. But if you don't, and so many of us don't in the modern era, we've never lived through a pandemic before, right? We don't know how to really cope with this, the isolation and the break of things and the, all, the, all the shifting of the way our lives function, even now as we exit the inshallah of this pandemic, lives have shifted so much. Everyone who is a parent in the room, including myself, these kids are not born with manuals. Like, I don't know how to operate them. <laughs> like, there is something here that we need extra help. And if you have, again, the people in your life who can support you through that, you may not need the therapy. But if you don't, the Quran is very clear about ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. 
And in this case, the people of knowledge are the people who have spent the last several years of their life, years of their life studying this science. And have, you know, after you get your master's, which is already two years, or your doctor, which is five years or more, you know that in addition to that, to become licensed, to sit on this panel and become licensed professionals in the field, you know how many more years it takes after your master's or doctorate? At least three more years, sometimes more. 3,000 hours of supervised clinical care by a supervisor who supervises what they're doing before they can even sit for their licensing exam and become a licensed professional. So we're talking anywhere from five to eight, nine, ten years to sit on this panel and be able to tell you this or sit with you as a therapist and be able to help you. This isn't a, a walk in the park, folks. <laughs> This is a real career and a real profession that is governed by its own ethics and boards and takes a lot of work to be able to help the person in front of them. Why do I say all of this? Because to me, when I see, back to the Quran, when I see it say, ask the people of knowledge, the people of knowledge are those who've studied whatever question it is that you have. If it's about marriage, go to the marriage family therapists and experts. If it's about parenting and about children, work with those who have worked specifically with children. If it's about trauma in everyday life, we work with those who are trained in trauma, subhanAllah. If it's about substance abuse, it's about suicide, whatever it may be, each of us actually have subspecialties in the type of therapies that we do. Does that make sense? Inshallah, that helps and kind of motivates and encourages us to move forward. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Just echoing what the other sisters were saying, for the work you're doing, I think it's so important for the community. So I feel really blessed that you're doing that for us and for Allah, first and foremost. On that topic, actually, uh, how does Islamically focused therapy differ from other Western therapies? Uh, in more of like a practical sense of what that might look like during therapy. They're all looking at me, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the question. And one thing we didn't actually mention in some of the work that we do behind the scenes with this group here at Madistan, mashallah, um, is actually something which you mentioned. We work with very similar to the name of my lab, because Marisan is connected and really the community-facing partner to the academic work we do in the lab. Why do I mention that? The lab is called the Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab. Muslim Mental Health is really what all of us are doing and from our programs. We all trained in you know, doctorate programs or master's programs, graduate level programs that work on mental health and license you in it. And we were interested in working with Muslims. We ourselves were Muslims. This is the field generally called Muslim mental health. It's Muslims working in counseling with Muslims, but they're using whatever essentially secular training that they have already received. A connected field, but different, is called Islamic psychology. That's a different field. The reason that's different is because Islamic psychology starts in my, if I'm going to share with you my definition of it, it basically starts with the foundations of Islam itself. And then you build on it a psychology versus Muslim mental health in which it's already a psychology already developed and you are filtering out what doesn't work for Muslims and then in adapting it to Muslims. So these are two connected but different fields. We recently wrote a book with a number of folks that have been, mashallah, really active in the field of Islamic psychology and it's actually about introducing Islamic concepts into clinical care. And you can get the book on Amazon. It's actually the TIP model, Traditionally Islamically Integrated Psychotherapy, TIP. The reason that model is really great is because it does exactly that. It's building the theory and foundation related to Islam and then building a psychology upon it. It's also the courses that I teach in Islamic psychology, whether they're at the Cambridge Muslim College, we have a whole diploma on Islamic psychology, or the trainings that happen with our friends and partners at the Khalil Center called the TIP training. Those, that that um, model is a little bit different. Essentially, it's clinical counseling by professionals, right? Same professionals, clinical counseling. But this is where you start getting the integration of Islam into the story. And so you might integrate the hadith, or you may integrate the verses of the Quran, or you might integrate actual um, exercises, techniques, and therapies within the therapy that you're doing. And that requires its own training. 
and a lot of the folks who built this model themselves were dual trained, so they were trained in Sharia plus counseling. And those who are taking it, and this is actually something we do in our didactics, basically all of us meet once a week to do didactic teaching, right? And we actually actually teach the TIP model to our therapists. Alhamdulillah, so they're actually all undergoing this TIP kind of training and learning um, over the course of our behind the scenes work of Madistan. So that when anyone in the community comes and says, I'm looking for Islamic psychology, or I'm just looking for counseling. You don't have to have the Islam in there if you don't necessarily want that. That would be more like Muslim mental health. But if you do want the Islamic psychology, then we're, alhamdulillah, training our therapists in that model, if that makes sense as well. Yeah, oops. Um, I'll also just quickly add something taking this right from Dr. Rania. So um, in, in the field of substance use, I think part of your question for me, what came up was also understanding emotions from the Islamic perspective and the expression of emotions from the Islamic perspective. So in the field of substance use, one of the most common things that we'll hear from Muslims who are struggling or Muslims who have used is I feel guilty, right? We hear I feel guilty all the time. And so one of the one of the important factors is when you're in when you're in a secular practice. So guilt as understood kind of or as as it's understood and more like secular practices if a muslim were to go into a therapist's office who's non-muslim and say I feel guilty. What do we think that psychologist therapist might say to them? Why? Everybody does it. You tried it. It's okay. Okay, we'll get better. Oh, you're struggling with an addiction. There's treatment, and they're not going to bypass the severity of what's happening. I want to be very clear that you're still getting professional care with a non-Muslim therapist. But the nuances, you know, that, like, what, as Muslims, we carry, knowing that, okay, maybe I've done something that really goes against the fold of Islam, or, or it really, like, it didn't sit right with me. Versus a Muslim therapist might tell you the guilt reminds you that you're a God-conscious conscious individual. It reminds you that there is Allah and it reminds you that you have done something that may have displeased Allah, but we come back from it. And, and so you reframe the way that you look at guilt in and of itself from this very like negative, like chunky emotion and expression to something that's actually very like unique to Muslims in the way we understand it as like, you might come back, come back from that and say, oh, because I could not feel guilty. Imagine that. Imagine I did all this stuff and I don't feel guilty. That's, that's very different. So it's also just, you know, a lot of like reframing of the way we understand things from the Islamic perspective and embedding those practices into, into like one-on-one -on -one care. And I know at the, at the clinic and at another clinic I worked at as well, we got a call from, from a young sister who, um, she did not want, she's like, I want a Muslim therapist, but I want no Islam in embedded into my healing. I just want straight professional care. And I said, no problem. And it was something very, and so her and I were in discussion, what's going on? You know, how do we get you the best care? Who, who on our team? And she said, you know, blah, 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 Ramadan's coming up, blah, 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 and kind of just went through this. And then she kind of stopped on the phone with me and she said, I didn't have to explain Ramadan. I didn't, when I said Ramadan is coming up and you know, this, the, the, the family situation and everything, you already understood that Ramadan was a very communal time, but Ramadan was a time where family comes together. And so for her navigating this extremely high communal time in the current circumstances that she was in, it was enough for her that we understood what Ramadan meant. And so it's also kind of just considering aspects like that, like the way we look, sometimes having care from somebody who looks like you is so important. That visual representation, the, the connection, you're like, we are, we're really in this together. So inshallah, that's of benefit to you and of course everybody else, but inshallah, that's a, a little example. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I actually wanted to share a personal experience with, um, uh, that relates to that question. Um, I have my own therapist as well. It's a Muslim therapist, alhamdulillah. Uh, but um, recently I thought, you know, maybe I wanted to try working with a non-Muslim therapist. With a non-Muslim therapist, really to get the, gain the experience of, you know, how is it to be working with somebody who is not Muslim? Because oftentimes in the community we do encourage community members to seek services or support from a Muslim. And it was interesting, um, I was talking to my therapist about um, my challenges with, like, keep keeping consistent with prayer, uh, the five, five times prayer. And, you know, I was telling her I didn't grow up 
uh, praying, didn't grow up in a very practicing family. So I, you know, as I became older and uh, gained that consistency, that's always a challenge for me. And I was really surprised because I've, of course, I've had this conversation with my Muslim therapist too. You know, I was really surprised that her response was, you know, maybe deep down you really don't want to pray. And maybe this is an internal con uh, conflict that you have and that you've been pressured to believe that prayer is important. And like I, that just, like I literally just paused for a few seconds and I was like, no, I, you know, prayer is really important for me. I want to work on being consistent. And, but again, it was interesting that she was consistently, her response was, maybe that's because somebody told you that it was important and you don't really believe in it. And, and in that moment, I thought, wow, you know, this is why it's really important to be working with a Muslim therapist. Wanted to share that. So, uh, to that guilt point, like, uh, I agree, but I, uh, I also feel that, you know, if I go to a Muslim therapist, I may not be comfortable to express that guilt Maybe I will be thinking how I will be judged as being a Muslim because that person also knows Islam. If I go to the non-Muslim, I may be more uh, comfortable uh, expressing those guilt and seeking. So, how? What's your take on this? Like, yeah, I'll start. But I actually think this is a great question, even beyond guilt. Um, so, you know, it's, we, we wrote a paper in the lab and we looked at literature from about 1979 to 2021 um, on Muslims and addiction. And we looked at, um, really, it was a global study. Um, and actually, this came up in, in some of the papers. It was individuals indicated that, um, well, if I go to a Muslim, they know what I did is wrong. And I don't want, I don't want to deal with that. And so I'd rather go to the non-Muslim um, or I'd rather not go to treatment at all. And this is something that we saw very common. I actually, um, in one in one of the papers that we that we read, there was a brother who who was struggling with an addiction, and he was he was offered free rehab as part of this research study. And he said, I'm not going to go because if I go, he's like, he's from a very small community. He's like, everybody's going to know where I went. And then when I come back, all I'm going to hear is, you know, you struggled with this addiction. And he's like, um, he was scared he would never get married. He was scared he would never get a job. And he was scared the community was just going to abandon him. And so this is a, a very real concern. I think from, from my perspective, and I'll, like I said, I think it's a more general question because this comes up with you know, Dr. Rania does a lot of suicide research and it comes up with perhaps like suicidal ideation or kind of anything else. One of the important things to, to remember is, again, Jenna touched on this, is everybody is a professional in the field. So even when, when people come to us and uh, you're, you're kind of taught to check in with yourself, again, going back to the importance of why we also go through care ourselves. So when you're talking to your Muslim therapist, they're also coming from this, they're not coming from the lens of judgment. That's not why they're there. They're coming from the lens of, of support, of treatment, of healing. And it's it's really, this a lot of community talks, this is actually one of the first talks where we didn't heavily talk on stigma, but the role of stigma is really big in general in, in kind of like perpetuating these feelings that our community has. And so I, I want to assure everybody is what, what you come with is we meet you where you are. And if that's like you're not going to disclose on day one, I promise you that, hey, I'm struggling with an addiction. That It's probably, I don't know that that happens as often, unless it's like you've gotten into some legal thing and then now you have to get treatment. It it, it's, it builds up. And so very slowly across, a, kind of along the journey of your care, you might slip things to your therapist and then they might hear it, but you're not ready to talk about it so they don't bring it up. And so kind of remembering that our job is not there to judge you. That's not for us. That's not why we're there. Um, the, the therapist's job is to really just sit down, hear you, and support you, and facilitate healing in a way that matters to you. And so it's also, um, it's understandable that you, we as community members might have this notion of, I'm going to be judged. And that's why I said it was more general, because we have people who won't even go to therapy, because right off the bat, they're like, I'm going to be judged for feelings of depression, or I've had a lot of anxiety, and I'm going to be judged. And so... I'm going to end with it's not our responsibility to sit there and judge you. That's not really what we're there for. Our, our, our real goal is to just make sure you're getting care. In the field of substance use, Dr. Rania actually talks about how it's 
it's a stigma within a stigma. And if you're, if you're a male, it's a stigma within a stigma within a stigma. SubhanAllah, it's so difficult um, because there's just so much, you have to overcome the barrier of it being a mental health struggle. And then you overcome, you know, the barrier of it being like addiction, something that is so, that is something that is haram in, in, you know, in our, in our faith and in our practices, but haram doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And so you're overcoming that. And if you're, you're a man, you're overcoming the societal notion that I, I need to be strong and available for my family and stuff. And so I'll, I'll kind of pass on to Dr. Rania. Do you want to address a little more of that? Chola and how to kind of support a little better. Thank you. I'll just add really quick just to also clarify the point of the Muslim and non-Muslim therapists. I want to be very, very clear that professional care for somebody who needs help and care, whoever they may be, is better than no care at all. Hands down. There's just no comparison between somebody leaving themselves to completely, or their family, or their n n lack of knowledge on the issue, deteriorating, but getting, even if it's partial help and support with a non-Muslim therapist, then of course we would say it would be really helpful if somebody understood the culture and background. Here's what I want to say, and part of the work we do actually at the lab is we've created, alhamdulillah, in this whole year actually, we've spent a lot of time creating uh, what we call religious and spiritual clinical competencies in working with Muslim patients. So we've built out a whole clinical competencies training and probably on the order of about every week or every other week, I'm at some university training their psychology staff, their therapist staff or doctors on working with Muslims. Why am I spending so much time doing that? And literally creating a, it's a research uh, type of training program where we're actually collecting pre-testing and post-testing and making sure it works and making sure it's actually helping and effective. And the reason I'm doing that, I'm so dedicated to that. I think the last three weeks I've been at the University of Minnesota and I was at the UC San Diego and then Harvard and then whoever, I mean, hop, literally hopping across the country or by Zoom, alhamdulillah for Zoom. <laughs> Mashallah. The reason I spend so much time doing these trainings from non-Muslim clinicians is I realize there are so many more people that need help than we have Muslim clinicians available. And it is better to train your non-Muslim clinicians on at least some level of clinical competency working with Muslims than leave them completely adrift without any knowledge of how to really work with Muslims. And you're going to get some really good people who are not Muslim, but they're good and sincere people and they're trying to understand. And you're going to get some terrible people. <laughs> just, that's how it is, just like any profession in any field. And like you were, the, the thing you said earlier, both of you, of you have to keep on, if you don't like the first therapist, keep on trying another. And you don't like that one, try another one. It takes a while to find the right person, don't give up. And it may be that they're not Muslim, and it makes sense for your, if, if you're very well known and it's a small community, or if it's something that it's a small group, you might actually want to go outside of that group, and that makes perfect sense. And if you work with a therapist who's not Muslim and who could use a little more extra help, alhamdulillah, we have the trainings. We literally have one that's on the APA, the American Psychiatric Association. Imagine, they commissioned me to do a training that's three hours long where I'm literally talking on how do you work with Muslims on mental health, and they literally made it free, which is very rare, for the next couple of years for any clinician who wants to take that training. It's on their website. Happy to give you the link. We actually have a code for it on our table outside. Why? because I'm so dedicated to just let the Muslims get help. It doesn't matter where and whose hands it is. At some point, we'll have enough people in the field that actually are Muslim and trained. Inshallah, many are coming through the pipeline, alhamdulillah. But until that happens, let's also train our non-Muslim clinicians too, how to work with us. I hope that helps, inshallah ta'ala. We're dedicated, we are committed here. <laughs> Maristan, inshallah. <laughs> Uh, my question is that, um, like, what do you all, what do you all do to not be impacted by like the tragedy and the trauma that you guys um, hear constant on a constant basis? And like, as us average people, um, what can we, what tips do you have for us that we we may be able to um, implement by just you know sometimes we're trying to help our friends out or. Uh, a family member out and you know then we're carrying that for days with us so um, if there's anything that you can share um, I can say two things about this and I just passed to other colleagues to talk about this because this is very important I believe <clears throat> first things is um, I was going to talk about the boundary but I uh, forgot but this is very important not only boundary between family members but also boundary at work so when I'm working from nine to five or nine to nine, actually, um, in therapy, 
And then I'm going to my family. I have my own life. I have my weekends. And I just want to spend my time. It's very important to set that boundary that this is, this is different. This is my, I'm going to their wolf uh, when I'm like providing the service. But my own experience is different from that and distinguish between these two things, especially for me as a couple therapist, I'm married too. And I just like, sometimes it's common. This is like, you're real humans to compare that experiences when, um, what my client's going through. But, um, I learned that I should like, um, when I'm done with my work, I should just put everything there and just try to be like coming back to my own world and my inner world and my family and not comparing all those things or all traumas that is happening in my client's world to take it to my own um, things. And second, as we talked about that address this, about seeking support, professional support, personal support, social support. These are all things important for a therapist. And that's why I believe like for a therapist, it's more, more important to seek for therapy because of um, actually these struggles, these like potential that they get affected by um, um, clients' traumas. And I usually, in my own therapy, I talk about, sometimes it happens that I talk about the cases that I struggle with, I'm getting impacted by uh, my clients. So like, this is like a professional support. Sometimes uh, by having like social friends or even like colleagues that uh, just hanging out with my colleagues and talk about like these struggles, it helps me to feel like that um, common humanity. And that's um, like a common experience that helped me a lot to not get affected and to go through this. So just again, as like, as a human, like other clients that we encourage them to not isolate themselves and not going through that loneliness. This is same for us as a clinicians to seek for support in any way. Just to, to that point quickly, you asked how we don't get affected. We do. People in the mental health field aren't invincible. You know, we have feelings and we get affected just like everybody else does. And that's really just that importance of checking on people in your life. You know, that saying, check on your strong friends really is true. Um, and that's something that we really try to embody in our work. Like Mona, as my supervisor, she'll be like, Jenna, how are you? And I'm like, oh, I did this. And I did. she's like, no, no, I didn't ask what you accomplished. I asked, how are you? So it's important to just make that space for each other Um you know, whether it's in the wake of a tragedy, I know it's, it's Black History Month and our community is kind of, we're still reeling from a recent, another recent death in the Black community, may Allah protect us all. Um, but really just taking that time to see one another for who we are and to make that space. Um, again, a colleague, like we started our meeting, she just asked me how I was doing about that rather than checking on my work tasks immediately. So recognizing that one, you're not alone. Everybody feels feelings. I promise you, even like the top therapist in the world has feelings and gets affected and needs their own help. So we're never alone in our feelings of things. Um, and to really just put each other's humanity before each other's work, before each other's productivity, your tasks is really just to see our brothers and sisters as our fellow human beings and to prioritize their needs before we kind of bombard them with the things that we might need from them. We could continue kind of passing down the mic and each person adding and close it up with this, unless there's a specific question still out there. Okay. We did start. Wait, so you'd like to give people some more time? Do folks want to take a little more time with the questions? Yes, Shalva? Okay. Okay, then let's, let's, let's prioritize our questions, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'll make mine really quick because I know we have a lot of people having questions. Uh, Jazakallah for you guys for this conference has been super informative. Um, the question I had is one of the first things that kind of drew me to psychology was, you know, seeing such a high divorce rate, especially in the Muslim community. Like when you see the statistics, like 50% and above, you know, it gets you thinking like where the problem is stemming from, right? And I think one thing that I've kind of learned um, throughout my life is that a lot of these things are passed down, um, whether it's anger and that kind of thing where relationships it gets passed down to the children. So how can we as like an Oma break the cycle of all those trauma and negativity being passed down from generation to generation? I'll 
I'll say something really quickly and then inshallah maybe Hamid can go. Um, so when I was still in Canada, I actually studied professional counseling and I was originally doing a marriage and family um, certificate. And then I had the same epiphany. I, I got married really young and everybody that got married in the same year plus or minus, you know, year and a half that I did was divorced within three years. And, and so by the time I started studying, I looked back and I said, these are people I grew up with, people I know, like I know you. And subhanAllah, I, I always say after you get married, people think you're like, mashallah, the genie. Like they come and they ask you questions and you're like, oh, man, I just got here. Like I need a minute, right? To So as I was going through the program, I actually contacted um, the admissions and I said, can I swap my certificate to do family and youth support work? Because a lot of the times that I would talk to people who were married, um, I realized that the, the problems weren't always maritally specific. They were kind of individually. And then as I talked about earlier, you it kind of comes into your marriage because you are a part of that relationship. And so I switched and I did family and youth support work. And my primary work is with a lot of, I, I, I focus a lot of my research more on adolescents and a lot of my clinical work, inshallah, is the age group I want to work with because it's, it, we, we need to, Sister Noza touched on this earlier, and it's the mentoring of certain behaviors from a parent to a child. And so if we, if you're a parent who has struggles regulating your emotions, do you think your kids, mashallah, are going to grow up to be like A, a plus emotion regulators? SubhanAllah, they're going to learn it from you. They're going to learn um, if mom or dad had an angry outburst, maybe that's an okay behavior. And then they grow up with this notion that that's okay. Mom and dad used to do it. And, you know, as a kid, I mean, alhamdulillah, we're all born born from some, some from someone and we all have parents. It's understanding that your parents are like, you know, there's like, prof, there's subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our prophet, and then our parents. Like, they are everything for you. And so one of, I think, to, to kind of your point is um, the importance of everything that was said on the panel and the breakdown of the various types of services that you can access. So if you're looking to get married, Jenna talked about premarital coaching. It's a thing. People come to therapy before they get married because it's like, and I've seen this happen. People call me two weeks before they're getting married. They're like, sister, I want to start therapy. I was like, oh my God, mashallah, this is like a few months of a project. It's not like an overnight thing. But they'll come in and people will talk about I grew up like this and then you realize they're they're carrying so much and you know signing a piece of paper to get married doesn't mean we've left everything kind of in our peripheral like that's not the way it's going to work so they come to therapy a year before they want to get married and even if there's no partner i want to be very clear sometimes it's i want to ready myself for finding a partner it's not even that they have somebody in mind and then they're starting to work through these little things and then by the time they're ready to find that partner and inshallah may allah grant everybody a righteous partner and a righteous spouse and um by the time they're ready they're like i feel i feel light i feel good i've talked through a lot of things and therapy is not going to 100% prepare you for marriage. Every marriage is different, unique, and, you know, people are not the same. But it's it's kind of taking a step back also and recognizing, I think Al Medina Institute sent an, e sent an email a while back, and Dr. Rani and Sheikh Rami also actually says, say this, and it's that, um, you know, therapy is cheaper than divorce, and it really is. So, you know, get therapy, don't get divorced. Um, and not that it's going to fix everything. Wallahu alam, we hope that, um, we hope that through work like this, we can support the reduction of a lot of these rates and just support families and uh, more kind of like skill building, which I think is really important. But um, Hamid, do you want to? I have a lot to say about this, but <laughs> I just want to make it short that, uh, yes, the rate is real high. And I believe like uh, there's some like aspects to it. First is that I believe it's about expectations. They're not a realistic expectation about marriage, especially among like uh, young adults. And like, especially I believe social media has a really a negative impact on it. They see couples on social media that say, oh, everything looks great. Oh, that's great. That relationship is like this. And, but no, it's not like that. And there's so many challenges and there's so like ups and downs. And uh, we, when we like enter into marriage, we're accepting all the, things on it, right? Like all aspects of negatives and positives. And um, so expectations are an important role in this. Second, 
like not addressing the problems, the small problems, and it gets big over time. And sometimes you see like a couple, they're like they're close to separation. They're saying, "Why you're separating?" They said like because of specific like topic. And you see like this is insane. Like what do you mean? Like by this small things you are going to divorce? And that's that's not a thing. Usually there's a years of like challenges that they do, they didn't address, and now this small things gets big. This is small things triggers trigger them easily. Um, so that that's very important to actually address the small things that is happening. That's why I really encourage like young couples that seek for this support, identify their patterns to see definitely even people in the first year of their marriage, they're facing some challenges, but they feel like, okay, it's not that big, so let's get over it. But if they address the pattern, understand what's going on in their marriage, that helps them to like, um, long term they're not getting triggered by those things or those small things so first thing to answer your question is knowledge to realistic knowledge about like this is what we're going to expect and learning about it and that helps them a lot hear me oh perfect i work i work as a high school teacher and I would have so many instances where students will come to me and tell me like all these very, very heavy stuff. And as we talk through it, I would just bring the idea of like, hey, have you maybe talked to a counselor? We have one on site and everything. And they're like, no, I'd rather just talk to you. And they just like get so heartbreaking because like how do you help someone like have those coping skills when you are not even like have any like qualifications? And I think majority of the time, it just ends up me being sitting there and acknowledging. And then I'm like, maybe we should, I'm like, I try not to give any suggestions, but majority of the time, like, but I do want to give them those coping skills. But also, I don't want to interrupt that conversation where they're like, okay, turn to therapy session. I'm okay now. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just tell me, tell me. So how do you help students navigate those emotions, but also like not wanting to be the therapist, which is, I feel like is hard. Michelle, that speaks to you as a teacher, that you have built those connections with your students, that they're coming to you. So thank you for that. And I think um, one of the things that we have to remember is that as a teacher, you can't carry all of that for your students. Listening is building that connection and being a, an adult, a safe adult to go to and be able to talk about it. That's the first step. So you've built those connections. And what I would encourage you to do is, um, we do warm handoffs at our school, and that might be something that you do. And it's just after you've built that connection and you've, you've listened to them, it's very powerful just being that listening ear, right? A lot of these kids don't have an adult to talk to and no one to listen to. So know, know that that's what you can do. And, and um, sometimes we have to really be realistic on the expectations we have for ourselves. A lot of times with these kids, the stories are horrific. One of the things about working in schools is it's not a clinic where people have the wherewithal to come, they make an appointment and they come. In schools, you hear a lot. And a lot of times those parents aren't gonna let you work with them as a therapist, but they're suffering. And and so, alhamdulillah, first of all, thank you for being there. And sometimes just being that, that having that relationship with that student is very powerful. Most likely they don't have that relationship with anyone else and they are learning that while they are safe adults who will at least listen to me. Sometimes they can't, you can't change what's going on for them, but you could be that listening ear and being that positive adult. What I'd also encourage you to do as you listen to them and just say, you know, I, I, I hear you, I'm sorry for what you're going through. I would like you to come with me to the council. Let's go talk and get some ideas. And you might have to sometimes do a warm handoff, go with them, but it takes time. And I think for yourself, I would encourage you to take care of yourself. Like you have your, you know, someone to, for you to process whatever's going on with you. You can go to the counselor and let them know um, this is what's happened for this kid. Process for yourself, because that's a lot, that's a heavy load. And realizing that we can't change everyone's life. And I think it speaks to some, what you were saying, how do you take care of yourself? Of course, we have our consultations and groups built in and we, we go to our own people, support people, but also being realistic and realizing we can't change everyone, right? That is with Allah. But what, we, what I can do, maybe in this instance, all I can do is hear them, hear them out, right? And seriously, I make a lot of dua for some of the students that I run into. Um, because in the end, that, that's who, who 
who brings us peace or solves our, you know, our problems or what have you. And so um, looking at, and you had to, uh, this previous person who had asked a question asked, can you give us some tips? I think one of the really big an, an advice that I would give you is look to the areas of what you can control. Sometimes we go get so caught up in the injustice of things and it's outside of our control. So we've just got to let that go. This is not something I can control. What I can control and what I can do is just be that listening ear, right? And make the offer this person and then you just got to kind of let it go. I think I'm just going to quickly add one thing, Sister Nuzet, as you said that. I think one of the important things you can do for your friends or sometimes when family calls you um, is sometimes people just call to vent. And clarifying that in onset is really important. So sometimes you might have a friend who calls you. If you're like really psychologically in tune and like you've got so much emotional intelligence, you're like, do you have space for me as I vent, you know, through the next five minutes? And you might say like, you know, if you're in a position where you really can't carry that, just be honest. Be like, hey, you know, I'm really sorry. Um, can we schedule a time to call in like an hour? Maybe you're in the middle of something. Um, and, and so also just recognizing when it is that I can actually support you and when it is that I'm just going to hear you out and say, I'm sorry, that sounds really tough you know I'm making I'm keeping you in my draws versus sometimes we get we spring into like action oriented and we're like I know a clinic and I know a therapist and we kind of want to give all these resources and it could just be that this person is their brain is not they're not even thinking about getting help they, they're just like I just need to dispel this off my chest and so it's I it's really a difficult position to be in and being that person who constantly receives it um, but even setting that internal expectation for yourself is I'm just gonna hear them out I'm not you know I'm not 100% responsible for what happens from here in terms of if they seek support, maybe you've given them resources in the past and they just keep blowing up your phone, but um, kind of just being that, being that person as well. Right, inshallah, that's helpful for you and the system. Sorry, I just, the, as a high school teacher, I just wanted to say one of the other things you might ask them is what is what are your worries about going to the counselor, right? Really just getting at the worries, what are their concerns so that you could address So, alhamdulillah, um, let's make this the last question, inshallah. So, we have a time to maybe go to the beautiful Maristan counseling room, inshallah, before Asr. Uh, so, I've been watching many of the online comments coming in, alhamdulillah, um, a lot of uh, viewers. Many of them seem like they're not from the Bay Area. They're viewers from around the country, and they're kind of envious of this amazing, alhamdulillah, resource that we have. Uh, so, perhaps after our, our Asr, we can put our forehead to the ground and do such as a shukr. For, for having this for ourselves and our families because, you know, I, I grew up in Missouri, rural Missouri, and, uh, you know, I, I probably needed therapy after going to a therapist because, alhamdulillah, very well-meaning therapists but weren't culturally competent. So, alhamdulillah. So this question came online, and I think it's important with the postmodern uh, discussion that we've been having in the congregation recently. Uh, the sister asked, how can we support individuals who adopt secularism and do not have purpose in life? So they're talking about Muslim families that... Or you got kind of in this wave of secularism, I'd say. Let's say. Looking at me again. Okay. Um, to our online viewers, thank you for being with us. We actually, there's actually a number of people online. We're Barakallahu <laughs> fikum. We're very much making sure that you know that we are, that we know that you're with us. Alhamdulillah. And thank you for this question as well. Um, there are so many resources I actually want to point you in the direction of um, for yourself. Actually, not so much for the person. Because one of the things that we learned, hopefully today, we walk away with is that you can't change someone else. It's the first rule of therapy that we teach. You can't actually change someone else until they want to change. That's really important. You can inspire change. You can be someone who, alhamdulillah, is so grounded in what you're doing that you literally inspire someone to change. But you can't force someone else to change. And I think that's really, really, really important that we all kind of get that. And it also aligns with our Islamic understandings too. And so the reason I say that is it's really so much a question for you more than the person you're actually asking about. That if a person in your life, the, here the question was related to secularism, but if you told me any other ism, I'd probably tell you the same thing. Which is that if it's something that's different to you, you're not happy with, you feel that actually this is something that maybe they're going down a route that may be very harmful and that very well may be true. Part of this is knowing what to do for yourself. 
And how do you then interact with this person who otherwise is in your family, your loved one, a friend? How do you interact with them? So that I always say this is so important, especially in family work. You know this, Hamid, in family work with in-laws. We didn't talk about in-laws today. Interestingly enough, that didn't come up. Anyhow, we'll have another session on that one, inshallah. <laughs> Um, but very, very, very importantly, I always say, make sure you keep the door open. Make sure you keep the door open. Why? Because it may be a stage. It may be a phase in someone's life. I see this because I'm on a college campus, and I work with what we call transitional-aged youth. This is the prime time when literally all kinds of theories are being thrown at them in the university. Things that maybe they didn't grow up with, or if they hadn't heard it before, they're not fully grounded in their own concept of their own self. That when these theories, especially these professors, I know I'm one, but I get it. You throw things at very impressionable people, and they're like, oh, 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 maybe that's better than what my parents taught me, right? And so when that happens, this is the time where actually keep the door open, because it may just be a phase. It may be a passing phase to the next thing. Or it may be something they say, I have found myself. I'm going to be X, fill in the blank, X, Y, Z. And so you need the support, actually, to know how to keep the door open, even though they're frustrating you, or even though you're really worried about them. Don't ever underestimate the power of dua and prayer. And look for the resources. And here, earlier today, we had the Yaqeen Institute, right? The, the president of Yaqeen, Sheikh Omar Suleiman, was here earlier today. And they have done so much work and, re and, and, re and research on the topic of secularism. And they've also done work and research on the topic of what happens when people quit faith, or they're not sure about faith, or they're walking away from it, they're getting separate from it, or those who, again, very, very common in my field, the medical field, the science field. I, I told the story because it just happened in the last few months. I've told it a few times about like being interviewed for a leadership position at Stanford for something, and having the interviewer <laughs> looking at my CV. <laughs> Really funny, well-meaning person that was <laughs> looking at my CV, and then he looked at me and he said, all of you is a paradox. <laughs> I said, khair, inshallah. And he said, he said, you're bringing science with a religion. I said, yes. He said, well, don't you see that as a problem? <laughs> Speaking of secularism, right? Don't you see that as a problem? And so I said to him, well, it depends on your worldview. I come with a worldview that does not have any issue with science and religion. You don't need to be a secularist to be able to be on point with your scientific understandings and a person of faith. He sat back in his chair in the interview, took a moment, and then he said, I'm humbled. I have a lot to learn. And I said, yes, you do. <laughs> in my mind, I said, yes, you do. <laughs> I said, we all do. We all have a lot to learn. But that's, <laughs> but that's really important because people sometimes it's a passing phase where they're kind of like, I'm a person of science. I can't possibly believe in this faith stuff. When in reality, I had a student just in my class just this week, one of our PsyD students actually said, I think I believe in religion just about as much as I believe in science. I said, okay. She said, actually, I don't think either one has a lot of scientific grounding. SubhanAllah. And I said, all right, we'll work with that. But the idea is that even in science, things seem like they're a fact. And they're not actually. We learn in school things like the theory of evolution. They don't ever say the word theory. They just say evolution, like it's real. It's actually a theory. But you're not taught it as a theory. This is what I mean. So people go down this route of science, or they go down this route where they're kind of like, it has to be, and therefore I have to take religion out of the story. And then they may grow out of this phase, or they may be someone who's really struggling with it, trying to figure out how to integrate the worldview, and they need some counseling and growth. But more importantly, it's you. It's you knowing not how to shut the door in their face so that when they're out of this stage, or even while they're during it, they're able to still have access to you. And I think that's really important because one day they may want access and if you've burned all the bridges, how are they gonna come back? How are they gonna come back? And the last thing I'll say, and it's probably a good ending point, as parents and those of us who are mentors and teachers and coaches and counselors that work with people, you all know I do a lot of youth work, alhamdulillah, supervise all the young girls that are in this community through the Rahma programs. And the teachers, mashallah, Allah bless them all that have done such amazing work in mentoring your girls. To me, it is so amazing when parents come and say, I think I've lost my kid. And I say, though, they didn't. Not that they lost them outside. I mean to say that they lost their Islam, their Iman. And I say, no, you didn't. Inshallah, you didn't. Because you have attempted to give them Islam. You have given them core values. You have taught them and showed them 
something, and maybe even they tasted the iman of it. As long as it's in their core. In Arabic, we had this whole lecture last night in the halakha actually about core and hearts and qalb, and the difference between qalb and fu'ad and, and sudr. I won't, go, I won't go through all that today. But one of the things that you say is lub. The Arabic is beautiful. All of these get translated in English as just heart. But each one in Arabic has its own meaning. And the lub is the inner, inner, inner part of the heart that the shaitan can't actually access. And that lub, if you've given your child, if you've given the people you've mentored Islam in their core, then inshallah they're going to find their way back to it. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu fikum. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate your support and your duas more than anything. As you know, we have a mission, a vision that we're starting off with here to really build out inshallah the Madistan. And we're going to need a lot of support. It's going to take a lot of money, <laughs> a lot of funding. It's going to take a lot of creativity. I'll make the same call I made in the morning. We need our creative people. We need the people, yes, our counselors and our therapists, yes. But we also need our finance people. We need our business people. We need our architects. We need our civil engineers. We need the people who are know how to, do real, know how to find good real estate. We need the people who know how to eventually build this holistic model of healing. Today, we've taken the first step, alhamdulillah, in a back to in-person. Alhamdulillah, we've taken a few first steps before this one because <laughs> we were doing virtual work. But today, alhamdulillah, we mark the first day that an on-site, in-person office is opened up in the Bay Area here at the MCC, which has been an amazing partner to us, alhamdulillah. Those of you who'd like, we'll walk over together to take a look at it, inshallah. Demystify therapy and don't, what does this therapy room look like? <laughs> You'll see that it's actually, alhamdulillah, a beautiful room. And that will be a first step. And we hope to keep on adding steps until we're able to fully actually build a full-on Madistan, we hope, inshallah. And I hope it's here before it's anywhere else. Please make dua. Please say ameen. Allahumma ameen. May Allah bless all of you. May Allah bless all those who are here and all your families and all the time you've taken from your families to be here on the middle of a day Saturday. And all of you online, may Allah bless you. Inshallah, as we expand, if we do well here, that we could expand to your communities, even rural Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> May Allah bless you all. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ma'ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. We ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to please accept from us. We ask you, Qubul, acceptance, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And we ask, Ya Rabbi, Hidayah, guidance for all. And we ask, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Shifa. Ya Shafi, O Healer, Ishfina. Ya Rabbi, give Shifa and healing to all that we love, ourselves and our families and loved ones. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. بارك الله فيكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته